Right. Pacific Women's Watch New Zealand, which is also known as New Zealand Women's Watch, was established in 2001, as you can see. We have what's called ECOSOC status, special consultative status with the United Nations. That means that we can report directly to the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Pacific Women's Watch New Zealand has a very wide representation. We have the Māori Women's Welfare League as part of our organisation, uh, Shakti, which you're probably all familiar with, um, disabled women's groups, Pacifica groups. We also have strong links to the LGBTI community, so we provide a voice for women throughout uh, New Zealand, and we are also charged with providing a voice in the Pacific. CEDAW, and there is a little leaflet about it, just sort of a summary explaining it, is the United Nations Convention on the Discrimination Against Women. And it was adopted in 1979. New Zealand has ratified it, which not all countries have done. It's sort of known as the uh, International Bill of Rights for, for Women. The UN CEDAW Committee reviews a country's progress in implementing CEDAW every four years and makes recommendations back to the country about how they're getting on and what they should be doing next. New Zealand's next review is next year, in 2016. Uh, the government's just released their draft report and they will be submitting a report in the middle of next year. Pacific Women's Watch New Zealand will also submit a report. Because of our ECOSOC status, we can send a separate alternative one and our research is underway. The Cities for CEDAW was developed by San Francisco in response to the fact that the United States has not ratified the convention, so we're a step ahead. <laughs> and it's a local implementation of a UN convention. We believe that Auckland um, would be wise to look at the CEDAW recommendations, and we would recommend that Auckland City adopt and apply a CEDAW focus in policy and action. So it's a bit of, but he's gone. I also have, uh, there's a handout there about what the Cities for CEDAW in the San Francisco is. Now, it doesn't reply, apply directly to Auckland because there are differences between how our cities run, but the fundamentals are the same. In implementing CEDAW, we would uh, recommend a gender analysis, and we note that already we have uh, demographic panels here in Auckland City, seniors, Pacifica, uh, ethnic, youth, disability, and rainbow, now, we could add another one at women, but our suggestion would be that you look at the data within those groups and perhaps tease out where women fit so that you'd have senior women, Pacifica women, disability women, and the disability group of women are one group that really do find themselves at the bottom of the heap. And uh, we did have a, one of our disability ladies coming, and I think she'd have been wanting to speak to you, but uh, she's unable to be here. So including a gender analysis that focuses as well on women, we would recommend. Some of the initiatives we look at, work-life balance, very important for the well-being of all. It's not just women. So a lot of these things apply across the board, not just for women. <coughs> Safety and safe access for everybody. Walking down the street with your pram and the, the, um, or your wheelchair and the uh, pavement's uneven, people fall, they've got a walking stick. We need those things fixed up. Women are often the ones that are out there walking. If it's good for women, it's good for all. There's also, in the terms of the city, an opportunity for pay equity and addressing the pay gap. I'm pleased to see that in the senior executive team, we've basically got equity. I think we've got four out of the nine senior executives are women. Well done, Auckland. I think we can pat ourselves on the back for that one. But on the council, there's still... Perhaps some Pretty gaps. <laughs> we're getting there. Yeah, that's right. I think we're about the same as uh, national government. It's around about a third of people in the elected positions are women, and uh, we need to work harder to get there. But one of the big things is that often we find women are in the lower pay bracket. So despite um, women being the ones that are coming through university, they are in the lower pay. So I challenge Auckland City to look at a living wage for all workers minimum. <coughs> so to finish, Auckland, the world's most livable city, that would mean it's a gender equal city. 
and that would be fantastic. Looking at eliminating all forms of discrimination. A thriving economy is built on workplace diversity, and that's diversity in all senses. Gender, ethnicity, all those things come into it. Equal pay for equal work and equal uh, pay for work of equal value. Equal opportunity and safe city environments. And I know a lot of women still find that there's parts of the city, aspects in the city that are unsafe. We ask that you review initiatives and plans through a gender lens. And how about looking at being a Seedor city with a sister city with San Francisco? So thank you. Uh, kia ora, and uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Councillor Penny H, and then Councillor Cathy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'm very happy to move the, the recommendation of thanks. And, you know, much as there's been debate around why a city would attend a climate change conference and why a city would be um, looking at UN issues and issues of gender equity. Our day-to-day -day life is actually wound up and bound up in all of these, and as we know, the transformation is going to take place city by city, not government by government, so I'm very, very happy to see this raised with us. Um, I don't think people need to be afraid that this is a whole bunch of ratepayers' money that's going to be spent doing a whole bunch of new things. It just, if we look at, and I, I think Councillor Casey may well pick that this as part of her forums that she runs, if we look at a slightly different lens through which we view that list of issues that we're endeavouring to address, I think we can go a long way. So I'm very happy to move the recommendations and express my warm support for Second. what's pointed okay. out. Um, now, you. Councillor Cathy, you've got a question? <coughs> yeah, I've got an amendment, really. It's um, we... OK, so we'll deal with that after any questions. Right, Ooh. that's all right. So this is a directional um, recommendation. Councillor Cathy, as we know, the rules are, let's ask a question. If no questions, then we'll deal with anything as a consequence of the presentation after. <coughs> right, good. Any questions? Councillor Dick and then Councillor Linda. Yeah. Um, I think the bloke, should, the bloke should try and ask some, some questions. Um, <coughs> and I'm, I'm, um, I, heard, I think I heard you say that not all nations have signed up to the UN Charter on Women's Rights. That's, that's Can you give correct. me a sense of what countries uh, haven't signed up? The USA has actually not signed. This is why the cities in the US are promoting it as a city-wide sure. program. So uh, the US is actually quite tardy in signing, actually ratifying UN conventions. They're quite happy in the United Nations to do it, but they don't <laughs> always uh, actually sign it. What other countries? Uh, off the top of my head, I'd, I'd struggle to get there, but I would imagine some of the more... Iran, uh, Iran. Somalia. Yes. <laughs> yes. Iran. I, would, I would think so, but I wouldn't like to say... The document. It's in the document. <laughs> it's in there. Yes, you can find it. <laughs> OK, so... Uh... But, but the majority have... Um, I haven't... I unfortunately didn't bring that figure, but the majority have signed, but there are some that haven't. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Lynn. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming along. I mean, I'm, I'm chairman of a family violence um, organisation that deals with the front line and the ongoing effects, etc., of um, violence against women. And um, I see you talk about the fact that you're meeting all these um, meetings with family violence. Which do you work through Women's Refuge? Or okay, so um, I know that 40% of um, at least 40% of Organisations that work in family violence don't work through, aren't part of the national collective. So there's quite a bunch of organisations not related to that and um, doing a lot of work. Um, so I, I guess it's um, just a plea to, you know, reach out to those other organisations because I know the one in West Auckland Family Action actually is the busiest in the country and it's not part of the collective. So um, and, and we'd be really happy to work with you because I think dealing with these issues day to day it's it's very evident we know we hear people say oh but what about you know women that hit men well yes they do but the percentages are so much lower it's like you know in the 90s for um, violence against women perpetrated by men sadly so this is a good week for you to be here when we've got um, white ribbon week and um, raising awareness so um yeah I'd really ask that you if possible, reach out to those other organisations because I'm sure they'll be very supportive. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Councillor Any other questions? Okay, so um, now, um, if you just sit there, please, uh, team. 
Uh, now, we've, uh, Councillor Cathy has um, uh, asked for a second recommendation to uh, refer this to her committee. Councillor Cathy, um, you just want to briefly uh, speak yeah, about uh, directional? We, we gave over a, a meeting of Community Development Safety Committee earlier this year to women, and it's the portfolio of Councillor Linda Cooper, and she's been doing a sterling job in getting figures and marshalling resources to, to progress that. And I just thought we might want an update on that. Um, well, there was a, some resolutions came out of that committee as well. So an update through a report to the February meeting would be timely and we can raise the issues that you have raised today. Thank you. Very good. I'm happy to okay, that. Okay, so that looks like a directional. It's been moved and seconded. We've got uh, Councillor Hulson and Pletcher who move it, so we just have it as part of the <coughs> whole recommendation. Um, um, Councillor. Sorry, um, and this is nothing against the report on gender issues being reported back, but don't we have a policy that we try not to ask for reports from public input? Sorry. And it's very embarrassing to have to do this under this particular issue, but... Oh, well, hang on. I'm just getting a little bit of that. Uh... It, it appears that we are able to do it. Mm -hmm. yep. Standing order really is a standing order issue. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. So um, thanks, Councillor uh, Penny. Uh, right. So we'll put it as a group. Uh, all those in favour, say aye. 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 It's against passed. Uh, so Christine and your uh, support. Thank you very much for coming along here today, and the discussion will continue. Uh, and just by way of information, we actually are sister city of LA. And have a very good well. uh, working relationship <laughs> with them. So it's probably be a bit beyond the pale to go to San Fran too. <laughs> okay, uh, next we've got Penny. Uh, Bright, Penny, welcome. Uh, you are well aware of the rules here, so uh, your five minutes uh, as uh, you start. And welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Councillors. Last week, I attended my fifth international anti-corruption conference, this being the um, Australian Public Sector Anti-Corruption Conference, and it's my third Australian Public Sector Anti-Corruption <coughs> Conference that I've attended. Uh, so what was achieved? As someone from civil society, particularly as a self-funded anti-privatisation, anti-corruption public, which, uh, public, which, <laughs> which, that's one. Which dog? Which dog whistleblower. Flip. Um, I was effectively in a league or category of my own. Almost all other attendees came from within the public sector, those working in-house for central or local government, including transport, corrections, police, statutory third party, public watchdogs, audit officers, ombudsmen, serious fraud office, commissions against corruption and the like, plus some elected representatives from state and local government, also top academics and top award-winning investigative journalists. What I've learnt is that a member of the public, <coughs> especially as an anti-corruption whistleblower, effectively, I'm from another galaxy. The corruption problems and solutions and style of work <coughs> of an anti-corruption whistleblower like myself is very different from in-house anti-corruption practitioners. And I have suggested directly to the commissioners of the three major Australian anti-corruption agencies, which are the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, the Queensland Crime and Corruption Commission, and the West Australia Corruption and Crime Commission, that I believe their conferences would be would benefit from being opened up directly to members of the public from civil society, particularly whistleblowers, because we're at the cutting edge. In my view, arguably, the main cause of corruption is the privatisation, contracting out model, private procurement model of public services, as opposed to those that used to be provided in-house by central and local government. Again, this hit me like a sledgehammer when I attended the 2010 Transparency International Anti-Corruption Conference. We were told in that one year, 2010 year, the global procurement market was $14 trillion, of which it was estimated 2,500 
$1.5 billion was estimated to be lost in bribery and corruption. Now, remember those Millennium Development Goals from 2000 to 2015? What could be done to help make sure that the benefits of globalisation were spread more equitably? The monetary budget for that was 40 to 60 billion per year. Total for the 15 years, $900 billion. Yet this one year, 2010, two and a half thousand billion estimated to be lost in bribery and corruption. Wouldn't that help feed, clothe, water and shelter a few poor people? It gives you the scope. Then I realised that Transparency International were not looking at what I perceive to be the underpinning problem, the private procurement model. They were just looking at the private procurement process or practice. My New Zealand research, based upon Official Information Act and Local Government Official Information Act requests, has proven that as soon as you get into contracting, you get into contract management. And I'll say it again. Government and council staff, the bureaucrats, are seen as too dumb to know how to do contract management. So private consultants are brought in to project manage, works contractors, a number of them who then subcontract this work. So you can have up to three layers of private sector contract docracy, the, <coughs> the pinstripe suits clipping the ticket before you get to the boots and overalls who actually do something productive. How on earth can that be a cheaper, more cost effective use of taxpayer or rate mate payer public money? So I believe it's now time to blow the whistle on Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, which New Zealand keeps coming either first <clears throat> or now second, because in my view, it's absolutely meaningless. Why do I say that? Because in New Zealand, the corruption reality is this. New Zealand has still not ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption. F it'll finally pass the enabling legislation, but we still allow small facilitation payments, bribes. New Zealand does not have an independent anti-corruption commission or agency. Members of parliament, who make the rules for everybody else, do not have an enforceable code of conduct. It is not an offence under the Local Government Act for New Zealand local government elected representatives, such as yourselves, Penny, to... you're working towards a conclusion. OK. Now. To you. breach the code of conduct. Um, it's not a lawful mandatory requirement for local government staff responsible for property or procurement to complete a register of interest.